the final tumbler turned. Behind the wall, the unmistakable sound of a reel-to-reel -reel cassette player starting. I told you! Montague half screamed. I tried to warn you of the horrors that await behind these walls! Pseudopod, Episode 605, July 27th, 2018. The Town Manager, by Thomas Ligotti. I'm your host this week, Anson Mount. Most people know me because of my day job, which is pretending to be other people, and I once made a very dynamic turn as a frog in grade school. I won't bore you with the tidbits of those credits, although the frog was the title character in Buford Goes to the World's Fair, which premiered in the White Bluff Elementary Cafeteria in the spring of 1982. Reviews were, well, mixed. I also host my own podcast called The Well, in which my producing partner Brandon Edgens and I uncover stories of creative thinking and inspiration. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or any of the one billion podcast platforms currently available, which all have links on our website, thewellpod.com. Thomas Ligotti is one of the foremost contemporary authors of supernatural horror literature. His works have been honored with several awards, including the Horror Writers Association's Bram Stoker Award for the collection The Nightmare Factory and the novella My Work Is Not Yet Done. Revised definitive editions of his first three story collections, Song of a Dead Dreamer, Grim Scribe, and Noctuary, were published in 2010, 2011, and 2012, respectively. Revised editions of his collections, The Agonizing Resurrection of Victor Frankenstein and Other Gothic Tales, and Death Poems, were issued in 2013. Ligotti has also published The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, a nonfiction work that explores the intersection of the darker byways of literature, philosophy, and psychology. Forthcoming titles by Ligotti include a collection of interviews and a chapbook consisting of two newly written stories and a Penguin edition for both Songs of a Dead Dreamer and Grim Scribe this fall. And if you go to this episode's show notes, you'll find a link to the website Thomas Ligotti Online. It was founded as a forum for discussions of, and media related to, Ligotti's writings, as well as those of a wide range of authors, artists, and musicians whose work is associated with the horror genre, among other areas of interest to devotees of unconventional art and thought. Whew. Mr. Ligotti stays busy. Your narrator for this episode is yours truly. I do hope you enjoy hearing it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Oh, and uh, we promise you, it's true. The Town Manager by Thomas Ligotti Narrated by Anson Mount One gray morning, some weeks before the onset of winter, some troubling news had swiftly traveled among us. The town manager was not in his office and seemed nowhere to be found. We allowed this situation, or apparent situation, to remain tentative for as long as we could. This was simply how we had handled such developments in the past. It was Carnes, the man who operated the trolley which ran up and down Main Street, who initially recognized the possibility that the town manager was no longer with us. He was the first one who noticed as he was walking from his house located at one end of town to the trolley station at the other end, that the dim lamp which had always remained switched on inside the town manager's office was now off. Of course, it was not beyond all credibility that the light bulb and the lamp that stood in the corner of the town manager's desk had simply burned out, or that there had been a short circuit in the electrical system of the small office along Main Street. There might even have been a more extensive power failure that also affected the rooms above the office, where the town manager had resided since he first arrived among us to assume his duties. Certainly, we all knew the town manager as someone who was in no way vigilant regarding the state of either his public office or his private living quarters. Consequently, those of us in the crowd that had gathered outside the town manager's office and his home considered both the theory of an expired light bulb and that of an electrical short circuit at some length. Yet, all the while... Our agitation only increased. 
Carnes was the one whose anxiety over this matter was the most severe, for the present state of affairs had afflicted him longer than anyone else, if only by a few minutes. As I have already indicated, this was not the first time that we had been faced with such a development, so when Carnes finally called for action, the rest of us soon abandoned our refuge in the theoretical. It's time to do something, said the trolley driver. We have to know. Ritter, who ran the local hardware store, jimmied open the door to the town manager's office, and several of us were soon searching around inside. The place was fairly neat, if only by virtue of being practically unfurnished. There was simply a chair, a desk, and the lamp on top of the desk. The rest of it was just empty floor space and bare walls. Even the drawers of the desk, as some of the more curious members of our search party soon discovered, were all empty. Ritter was checking the wall socket into which the lamp's cord was plugged, and someone else was inspecting the fuse box at the back of the office. But these were merely stall tactics. No one wanted to reach under the lampshade and click the switch to find out whether the bulb had merely burned out or, more ominously, if that place had been given over to darkness by design. The latter action, as all of us were aware, signaled that the tenure of any given town manager was no longer in effect. At one time, there had been a great chandelier, which hung in the town hall located at the south end of Main Street. When that structure fell into decay and finally had to be abandoned, other buildings gave out their illumination. From the upper floors of the old opera house, also vacated in the course of time, to the present storefront office that more recently had served as the center of the town's civic administration. But there always came a day when, without notice to anyone in the town, the light went out. He's not upstairs, Carnes yelled down to us from the town manager's private rooms. At that precise moment, I had taken it upon myself to try the light switch. The bulb lit up and everyone in the room went mute. After a time, somebody to this day, I cannot recall who it was, stated in a resigned voice, He has left us. Those were the words that passed through the crowd outside the town manager's office, until everyone knew the truth. No one even speculated that this development might have been caused by mischief or a mistake. The only conclusion was that the old town manager was no longer in control and that a new appointment would soon be made, if in fact this had not already been done. Nonetheless, we still had to go through the motions. Throughout the rest of that gray morning and into the afternoon, a search was conducted. And over the course of my life, these searches were performed with increasingly greater speed and efficiency whenever one town manager turned up missing as the prelude to the installation of another. The buildings and houses comprising our town were now far fewer than in my childhood and youth. Whole sections that had once been districts of prolific activity had been transformed by a remarkable corrosion into empty lots where only a few bricks and some broken glass indicated that anything besides weeds and desiccated earth had ever existed there. During my years of youthful ambition, I had determined that one day I would have a house in a grand neighborhood known as The Hill. This area was still known as such, a designation bitterly retained even though the real estate in question, now a rough and empty stretch of ground, no longer rose to a higher elevation than the land surrounding it. After satisfying ourselves that the town manager was nowhere to be found within the town, we moved out into the countryside. Just as we were going through the motions when we searched inside the town limits, we continued going through the motions as we tramped through the landscape beyond them. The time of year was so close to the onset of winter, and there were only a few bare trees to obstruct our view in any direction as we wandered over the hardening earth. We kept our eyes open, but we could not pretend to be meticulous searchers. In the past, no town manager had ever been found, either alive or dead, once he had gone missing and the light in his office had been turned off. Our only concern was to act in such a way that would allow us to report to the new town manager when he appeared that we had made an effort to discover the whereabouts of his predecessor. Yet this ritual seemed to matter less and less to each successive town manager, the most recent of whom barely acknowledged our attempts to uncover the dead or living body of the previous administrator. <coughs> 
want, he said as he sat dozing behind the desk in his office. We did the best we could, repeated one of us who had led the search, which on that occasion had taken place in early spring. It stormed the entire time, said another. After hearing our report, the town manager merely replied, oh, Yeah, I see. Uh, yes, well done. Then he dismissed us and returned to his nap. Why do we even bother, said Lehman the barber when we were outside the town manager's office. We never find anything. I referred him and the others to the section of the town charter, a brief document to be sure, that required, quote, a fair search of the town and its environs whenever a town manager went missing. This was part of an arrangement that had been made by the founders and that had been upheld throughout succeeding generations. Unfortunately, nothing in the records that had come to be stored in the new opera house and were subsequently lost to the same fire that destroyed this shoddily constructed building some years before had ever overtly stated with whom this arrangement had been made. The town charter itself was now only a few poorly phrased notes assembled from recollections and lore, although the specifics of this rudimentary document were seldom disputed. At the time, no doubt, the founders had taken what seemed the best course for the survival and prosperity of the town, and they forged an arrangement that committed their descendants to this same course. There was nothing extraordinary about such actions and agreements. But that was years ago, said Lehman on that rainy spring afternoon. I, for one, think it's time to find out just who we're dealing with. Others agreed with him. I myself did not disagree. Nonetheless, we never did manage to broach the subject with the old town manager. But as we walked across the countryside on that day so close to the onset of winter, we talked amongst ourselves and vowed that we would pose certain questions to the new town manager, who usually arrived not long after the disappearance or abdication of the previous administrator, sometimes on the very same day. The first matter we wished to take up was the reason we were required to conduct such a futile search for missing town managers. Some of us believed that these searches were merely a way of distracting us, so that the new town manager could take office before anyone had a chance to observe by what means he had arrived or from what direction he came. Others were of the opinion that these expeditions did in fact serve some purpose, although what that may have been was beyond our understanding. Either way, we were all agreed that it was time for the town, that is, what there was left of it, to enter a new and more enlightened era in its history. However, by the time we reached the ruined farmhouse, all our resolutions dissolved into the grayness in which that day had been enveloped. Traditionally, the ruined farmhouse, along with the wooden shed that stood nearby it, marked the point at which we ended our search and returned to town. It was now close to sundown, which would give us just enough time to be back in our homes before dark, once we had made a perfunctory inspection of the farmhouse and its shed. But we never made it that far. This time, we kept our distance from that farmhouse, which was no more than a jagged and tilting outline against the gray sky, as well as from the shed a narrow structure of thin wooden planks that someone had hammered together long ago. There was something written across those weathered boards, markings that none of us had ever seen before. They were scored into the wood as if with a sharp blade. Some of the letters were either missing or unreadable in the places where they were gouged into planks that had separated from one another. Carnes, the trolley man, was standing at my side, does that say what I think it says? He said to me, almost in a whisper. I think so. And the light inside? Like smoldering embers, I said, concerning the reddish glow that was shining through the wooden slats of the shed. Having recognized the arrival of the new town manager, from whatever direction or by whatever means he may have come, we all turned away and walked silently toward town pacing slowly through the gray countryside that day by day was being seized by the coming winter. Despite what we had come across during our search of the countryside that day, we soon reconciled ourselves to it, or at least had reached a point where we no longer openly expressed our anxiety. Did it really matter if, rather than occupying a building on Main Street with a sign that read Town Manager over the door, 
The one who now held this position chose to occupy a shed whose rotting wooden planks had roughly the same words inscribed upon them with a sharp blade. Things always had been moving in that direction. At one time, the town manager conducted business from a suite of offices located in the town hall and lived in a fine house in the hill district of town. Now this official would be working out of a weather-beaten shed next to a ruined farmhouse. Nothing remained the same for very long. Change was the very essence of our lives. My own situation was typical. As previously mentioned, I had ambitions of owning a residence in the Hill District. For a time, I operated a delivery business that almost certainly would have led to my attaining this goal. However, by the time the old town manager arrived, I was sweeping the floors at Lehman's Barbershop and taking whatever odd jobs came along. In any case... My drive to build up a successful delivery business was all but extinguished once the Hill District had eroded away to nothing. Perhaps the general decline in the conditions of the town, as well as the circumstances of its residents, could be attributed to poor officiating on the part of our town managers, who in many ways seemed to be less and less able in their duties as one succeeded the other over the years. Whatever apprehensions we had about the new town manager, it could not be said that the old town manager was a model administrator. For some time before his term came to an end, he spent the whole of each working day asleep behind his desk. On the other hand, every town manager could be credited with introducing some element of change, some official project of one kind or another, that was difficult to condemn as wholly detrimental. Even if the new opera house had never been anything but a shoddily constructed fire trap, it nonetheless represented an effort at civic rehabilitation, or seemed to be such. For his part, the old town manager was responsible for the trolley which ran up and down Main Street. In the early days of his administration, he brought in workers from outside the town to construct this monument to his spirit of innovation. Not that there had ever been a great outcry for such a conveyance in our town, which could easily be traversed from one end to the other on foot or by bicycle without causing the least exertion to those of us who were in reasonably good health. Nevertheless, once the trolley had been built, most of us did make use of it at one time or another, if only for the novelty of it. Some people, for whatever reason, made regular use of this new means of transportation and even seemed to depend on it to carry them the distance of only a few blocks. If nothing else, the trolley provided Carnes with regular employment, which he had not formally enjoyed. In brief, we had always managed to adapt to the ways of each town manager who had been sent to us. The difficult part was waiting for the new administrators to reveal the nature of their plans for the town and then adjusting ourselves to whatever form they might take. This was the system in which we had functioned for generations. This was the order of things into which we had been born and to which we had committed ourselves by compliance. The risk of opposing this order or plunging into the unknown was simply too much for us to contemplate for very long. But we did not foresee, despite having witnessed the spectacle of the shed beside the ruined farmhouse, that the town was about to enter a radically new epoch in its history. The first directive from the new town manager was communicated to us by a torn piece of paper that came skipping down the sidewalk of Main Street one day and was picked up by an old woman who showed it to the rest of us. The paper was made of a pulpy stock and was brownish in color. The writing on the paper looked as if it had been made with charred wood and resembled the same hand that had written those words across the old boards of the town manager's shed. The message was this. Dust. Troy. Trolley. While the literal sense of these words was apparent enough, we were reluctant to act upon a demand that was so obscure in its point and purpose. It was not unprecedented for the new town manager to obliterate some structure or symbol that marked the administration of the one who had come before him, so that the way might be cleared for him to erect a defining structure or symbol of his own, or simply to efface any prominent sign of the previous order and thereby display the presence of a new one. But usually some reason was offered, some excuse was made for taking this action. This obviously was not the case with the town manager's instruction to destroy the trolley. So we decided to do nothing until we received some enhancement regarding this matter. Ritter suggested that we might consider composing a note of our own to request further instructions. This note could be left outside the door of the town manager's shed, 
not surprisingly, there were no volunteers for this mission. And until we received a more detailed notice, the trolley would remain intact. The following morning, the trolley came tooting down Main Street for its run of the day. However, it made no stops for those waiting along the sidewalk. Look at this, Lehman said to me as he stared out the front window of his barber shop. Then he went outside. I set my broom against the wall and joined him. Others were already standing on the street, watching the trolley until it finally came to a rest at the other end of town. There was no one at the switch, Lehman said, an observation that a number of persons echoed. When it seemed that the trolley was not going to make a return trip, several of us walked down the street to investigate. When we entered the vehicle, we found the naked body of Carnes, the trolley driver, lying on the floor. He had been severely mutilated and was dead. Burned into his chest were the words, Destroy Trolley. We spent the next few days doing exactly that. We also pulled up the tracks that ran the length of the town and tore down the electrical system that had powered the trolley. Just as we were completing these labors, someone spotted another piece of that torn brownish paper. It was being pushed about by the wind and the sky above us, jerking about like a kite. Eventually, it descended into our midst. Standing in the circle around the piece of paper, we read the scrawled words of the message. Good, it said. Next. Your jobs will change. Not only did our jobs change, but so did the entire face of the town. Once again, workmen came from outside with orders to perform various kinds of construction, demolition, and decoration that began along Main Street and ultimately extended into the outlying neighborhoods. We had been instructed by the usual means not to interfere with them. Throughout the deep gray winter, they worked on the interiors of the town's buildings. With the coming of spring, they finished off the exteriors and were gone. What they left behind them was a place that did not resemble a town as much as it did a carnival funhouse. And those of us who lived there functioned as sideshow freaks once we had been notified by the usual method of exactly how our jobs had changed. For example, Ritter's Hardware had been emptied of its traditional merchandise and restructured as an elaborate maze of lavatories. Upon entering the front door, you immediately found yourself standing between a toilet and a sink. But into one of the walls of this small room was another door that opened upon another lavatory that was somewhat larger in dimensions. This room had two doors that led to further lavatories, some of which could be located only by ascending a spiral staircase or walking down a long, narrow corridor. Each lavatory differed somewhat in size and decor. None of the lavatories was functional. The exterior of Ritter's hardware was given a new facade constructed of large stone blocks and a pair of fake towers standing on either side of the building and rising some distance above it. A sign above the front door designated the former hardware store as Comfort Castle. Ritter's new job was to sit in a chair on the sidewalk outside his former place of business wearing a simple uniform with the word attendant displayed in sewed lettering below the left shoulder. Lehman the barber had been even less fortunate in the new career that had been assigned to him. His shop, renamed Baby Town, had been refurbished into a gigantic playpen. Amid stuffed animals and an array of toys, Lehman was required to languish in infant's clothing sized for an adult. All of the businesses along Main Street had been transformed in some manner although their tone was not always as whimsical as Ritter's Comfort Castle or Lehman's Baby Town. A number of the buildings appeared simply as abandoned storefronts, until one explored the interior and discovered that the back room was actually a miniature movie theater where foreign cartoons were projected upon a bare wall, or that located in the basement was an art gallery filled entirely with paintings and sketches of questionable taste. Sometimes, these abandoned storefronts were precisely what they appeared to be, except you would find yourself locked inside once the door had closed, forcing you to exit out the back. Behind the stores of Main Street was a world of alleys, 
where it was perpetually night, an effect created by tunnel-like arcades enclosing the vast area. Dim lamps were strategically placed so that no stretch of alley was entirely in darkness as you wandered between high wooden fences or brick walls. Many of the alleys ended up in someone's kitchen or living room, allowing an escape back into town. Some of them kept growing more and more narrow until no further progress was possible, and every step leading to this point needed to be retraced. Other alleys gradually altered in their backdrops, and eventually the scene changed from that of a small town to one of a big city where screams and sirens could be heard in the distance, although they were only recordings piped in through hidden speakers. It was in these precincts where painted theatrical backdrops of tall tenement buildings with zigzagging fire escapes rose up on every side that I worked at my own new job. At the terminus of an obscure alley where steam was pumped through the holes of a false sewer grating, I had been stationed in a kiosk where I sold soup in paper cups. To be more accurate, it was not actually soup that I was given to sell, but something more like bullion. Behind the counter that fronted the kiosk, there was a thin mattress on the floor where I could sleep at night, or whenever I felt like sleeping, since it seemed unlikely that any customers would venture through that labyrinth of alleys so that I might serve them. I subsisted on my own bullion and the water I used to concoct this desolate repast. It seemed to me that the new town manager would finally succeed in the task which his predecessors had but lazily pursued over the years, that of bleeding the town of the few resources that had been left to it. I could not have been more wrong in this assessment. Within a matter of weeks, I had a steady stream of customers lined up outside my bullion concession who were willing to pay an outrageous price for my watery yellowish liquid. These were not my fellow citizens, but people from outside. I noticed that nearly all of them carried folded brochures which either extruded from their pockets or were grasped in their hands. One of these was left behind on the counter that fronted my kiosk, and I read it as soon as business slowed down. The cover of the brochure bore the words, Have a fun time in funny town. Inside were several captioned photographs of the various attractions that our town had to offer the curious tourist. <sighs> I was in awe of the town manager's scheme. Not only had this faceless person taken our last penny to finance the most extensive construction project the town had ever seen, from which there was no doubt a considerable amount of kickback involved, but this ingenious boondoggle had additionally brought an unprecedented flood of revenue into our town. Yet the only one who truly prospered was the town manager. Daily, sometimes hourly, collections were made at each of the town's attractions and concessions. These were made by solemn-faced strangers who carried weapons. In addition, I noticed that spies had been integrated among the tourists just to ensure that none of us withheld more than the meager allotment of the profits that derived from the town's new enterprise. Nonetheless, whereas we had once had reason to expect nothing more than humiliation and total impoverishment under the governance of the new town manager, it now appeared that we would at least survive. One day, however, the crowds of tourists began to thin out. In short order, the town's new business had dwindled to nothing. The solemn-faced men no longer bothered to make their collections, and we began to fear the worst. Hesitantly, we began to emerge from our places and gathered together on Main Street under a sagging banner that read, Welcome to Funny Town. I think that's it, said Ritter, who was still wearing his bathroom attendance uniform. Only one way to be sure said Lehman, now back in his adult clothes. Once again, we tramped out to the countryside under a gray sky some weeks before the onset of winter. It was approaching dusk, and long before we reached the town manager's shed, we could see that no reddish light glowed inside. Nevertheless, we searched the shed. Then we searched the farmhouse. There was no town manager. There was no money. There was nothing. When the rest of them turned away and began to head back to town, I stayed behind. Another town manager would arrive before long, and I did not want to see what form the new administration would take. 
This was the way it had always been. First the one came and then the other, each of them exhibiting signs of greater degeneracy than the one before, as if they were festering away into who knows what, just as each day in that town was more dismal than the one before, and there was no telling where it would all end. How many others would come and go, taking with them more and more of the place where I had been born and was beginning to grow old? I thought about how different that place had been when I was a child. I thought about my youthful dream of having a home in the Hill District. I thought about my old delivery business. Then, uh, I walked in the opposite direction from the town. I walked until I came to a road. And I walked down that road until I came to another town. I passed through many towns, as well as large cities doing clean-up work and odd jobs to keep myself going. All of them were managed according to the same principles as my old hometown, although I came upon none that had reached such an advanced stage of degeneracy. I had fled that same place in hopes of finding another that had been founded upon different principles and operated under a different order, but there was no such place, or none that I could find. It seemed the only course of action left to me was to make an end of it. Not long after realizing the aforementioned facts of my existence, I was sitting at the counter of a crummy little coffee shop. It was late at night, and I was eating soup. I was also thinking about how I might make an end of it. The coffee shop may have been in a small town or a large city. Now that I think of it, the place stood beneath the highway overpass, so it must have been the latter. The only other customer in the place was a well-dressed man sitting at the other end of the counter. He was drinking a cup of coffee, and I noted, directing a sidelong glance at me every so often. I turned my head toward him and gave him a protracted stare. He smiled and asked if he could join me at my end of the counter. You can do whatever you like. I'm leaving. Not just yet, he said as he sat down at the counter stool next to mine. What business are you in? None in particular. Why? I don't know. You just seem like someone who knows his way around. You've been some places, am I right? I suppose so, I said. I thought as much. Look, I am not just interested in chit-chat here. I work on commission finding people like you, and I think you've got what it takes. For what? I asked. Town... Management, he replied. I finished off the last few spoonfuls of my soup. I wiped my mouth with a paper napkin. Tell me more, I said. It was either that or make an end of it. Thomas Ligotti is famous for being reticent when it comes to discussing his own work. As an artist, I respect the hell out of that reticence, because I understand it. As a fan, it drives me slightly insane. And as your narrator, it frightens me deeply. What if I were to use this moment to launch into a specific critique, pointing to clues that were meant as nothing more than simple flourishes by its author, ones he might not even remember writing? What if I were to lead you, the listener, down the primrose path, musing about the dark underbelly of American leadership and corruption, only to find out later from some other critic that Ligotti was actually writing about the horrors of our own self-deception? The truth, of course, is that there is no correct interpretation of an artistic work. Ligotti is, as I am, a believer in organicity. It's the idea that a story actually retains its own sort of ownership, and that one central meaning or interpretation can never be assigned to it, not even by its author. Just as a Rorschach blotch looks like a human heart to one viewer, it is seen as a hammer by another. Neither answer is correct or wrong. It's one of my favorite things about art. But knowing this doesn't relieve my tension. Though, in a way, it's the same tension at the heart of Ligotti's story. When the townspeople fret over questions about their own charter while repeatedly accepting the dictates of each new administrator. When they worry over what strange new acts will be expected of them and the meanings behind them. 
or when our narrator ultimately worries if he has a place in all of it, or if he should just make an end of it. Ligotti is not just weaving a creepy story. He's actually tapping into that thing at the core of our being which is already unsettled. Philosophers have called it angst, existential crisis, and, well, general sobriety. Whatever you call it, it's that thing in you that wants to peer into the dark room, or the dark shed, in the hopes that we'll finally face the shadowy beast behind our anxiety and come out the other side with some meaning. But we won't. Because, just like there is no one interpretation to a story, there is no actual town manager. Just someone, or something, that claims that office. But, and this is what I love about Ligotti's story, it isn't simply the administrators themselves, or even the distant unknowable powers which determine their line of succession, that unnerves us and the narrator. It's the town's ability to fool themselves into thinking that they will, one day, hold their leaders to task. After all, the best horror writers will tell you, it's not so much the boogeyman in the closet that scares us, as it is the boogeyman in us. The one that thrills itself with the idea that it might just one day jump up on that stage of the town hall and disrupt everything. That screams inside its own head, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore but knows deeper down it will never say that out loud. So, instead, we peer into the shed. Don't worry, do your work, look forward, leave the rest to us. This timeless sentiment strikes roughly one half of any given nation at any given time as having a chilling undertone. Then, eventually, when new leadership comes into play, that half relaxes does their work, looks forward, entrusts the new leadership. Just as with today's story, it's not necessarily the power of leadership which is so chilling, but our own ability to seesaw so readily between fits of paranoia and trust that falls directly in line with the best of horror fiction. And should we ourselves walk closer to that vertiginous edge of one day taking the helm and assuming leadership ourselves, Will our political boogeyman be able to retain the human inside? And what will that homunculus look like? Surely, to some it will appear much like a human heart. To others, it might just look like a hammer. Pseudopod relies on its listeners for funds, so if you like what you've heard, please consider donating. Or even better, subscribing. Just go to pseudopod.org and click the button that says, Feed the pod you'll also find a link to their patreon page where you can donate as little or as much as you like including a five dollar per month premium content membership if you don't want to donate money we totally get it times are tough but what you can do is go to apple Podcasts, stitcher or wherever you download your podcasts and write a review it helps believe me pseudopod is part of escape artists incorporated and is distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. Theme music is by permission of Anders Manga. And a special thanks to your regular host, Alistair, for letting me live out this little hosting fantasy of mine. In an email to Pseudopod co-editor Sean Garrett, Thomas Ligotti writes this. I think that whatever a thoughtful reader has to say about any literary work is of at least equal value to what its author may reveal about what he had in mind when producing it. Not every literary critic favors that view. I realize that it might even be considered somewhat old-fashioned by some. I'm not trying to be mysterious or reticent about the story. It's not a sacred scripture. That's just my viewpoint on critical commentary in general. I hope you and Anson Mount won't mind if I don't say anything more. No, Tom. We don't. In fact, we love you for it. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.